Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Presentation RPU, RP+. And you know what? I'm here for the world, really, if I think about it. Before we try to save the world, however, let's make sure we get our ducks in a row with advanced hypertrophy concepts. Specifically, number four, range of motion in training for muscle growth. Here we go. Let's take a look at the contents. First up is, what is a conservative range of motion and training? Like we'll talk about exactly what is up for grabs and what we're gonna be discussing. Why do we care? Number two, as you've probably become accustomed to in the series, is defining range of motion. Always have to define our terms so we know exactly what is being discussed. Probably 50% of discussions or debates online um, are er very erroneous because they don't come to a consensus on the definitions and then they spend a lot of time going around in circles. I have to get our definition straight of what is range of motion and it's a pretty complex definition, it turns out. And then there are four specific goals we want to achieve with range of motion uh, and we'll go through those. I won't detail them now, but you can see them on your screen. And then we're going to talk about a very, very um, closely related concept that if we didn't cover it, wouldn't be really doing uh, range of motion due diligence. It's exercise variation and force curve matching. And of course, then program recommendations and summary and implications. So why do we care about range of motion in training? Um, while it's to answer an interesting question, an example of which is like, you know, when you're doing leg press for bigger quads, how deep do you go? Like, can you imagine, imagine asking someone that, like, why are you going that deep and not deeper or not shallower? Imagine asking yourself that. What is exactly the answer to that? Now, um, I don't think the answer is immediately obvious. I think it requires some thought. Um, why? Well, you could say like, well, we're trying to activate the quads. Well, the quads are generally active at any range of motion, even isometrically. We can just put a thousand pounds on the leg press, almost lock out with it and press into the thousand pounds. It doesn't move. And you activate the quads to a significant extent. And uh, electromyographical data will show that your quads are very, very active. So, so they certainly get activation. There's certainly a force transduction or throughput, which is the number one cause of hypertrophy anyway. So all of a sudden, we're left wondering why we move weight at all, or we just isometrically contract. And if we start to describe as a why do we go through a range of motion, uh, the next question is which range of motion is a good idea? And, uh, you know, it's, it's t totally possible to say, you know, full ROM uh, is a good idea, but a lot of times people say that, and we'll get to this in a bit, uh, sort of dogmatically. Right? They'll say, well, full ROM, you got to do full ROM. And you say, why? And they're like, well, because, because otherwise you're like, you're, you're like bitching out. Like, yeah, as I understand, full ROM could be more challenging. We're not actually in the gym to challenge ourselves. What is, what are we in the gym to do? We're in the gym to grow muscle. <laughs> okay. That can be challenging as a secondary factor, but that's not the, the, the mission. That's not the whole point. Much more challenging thing to do in the gym is literally just repeatedly run into a wall face first without putting your hands up. That's way harder than lifting weights. That doesn't get you jacked. Maybe you make your face jacked after a while. But, um, you know, just because something is hard or more challenging doesn't mean we need to bully each other into doing it. We need to do it for a good reason. And the only good reason is muscle growth, right? Um, and it turns out that if we sort of really examine it, which is what we're going to do here, there are distinct benefits and downsides to various ranges of motion, Right. And we have to get real specific about what we're looking at, uh, what are the risks, what are the upsides, and figure out which way is a good way forward. Remember, when we're discussing this topic, the goal is always, in these advanced hypertrophy lectures, optimal hypertrophy. That's goal number one and probably goal number everything. A secondary goal, which just feeds into that goal, so it's really part of the same goal, is safety, right? And any one training session, any one rep that you do, uh, if it's very unsafe, it could be maximally hypertrophic and the next possible technique could be less hypertrophic per rep. But if the risk is huge with that one rep you did, that's, uh, you know, producing a lot of growth in that rep, but is very risky for uh, injury concerns, it just not, doesn't make sense to train like that all the time. Cause at some point you're going to get hurt. When you get hurt, you don't grow any more muscle until, uh, unless you heal. And so the situation really there is we have to make sure that when we're searching for the optimal ROM for training, which we'll be doing, we want a, a, a range of motion that grows a ton of muscle, the most possible, slash is also not uh, completely ridiculously unsafe, or it's actually close to maximizing safety. So let's get real specific. What is, when we say range of motion in the context of hypertrophy training, what do we mean? Okay. We really mean is we're talking about the exercise, range of motion of the exercise, and it's the number of degrees of angular displacement created at all of the involved joints. 
Like if you move, you know, your elbow from here to here, that's like, I don't know, 30 degrees. If you move it from here to here, that's like, you know, 95 or 100 degrees. The more range of motion, the more degrees of total, you know, angular displacement there is. If you move your shoulder as well as your elbow, we count shoulder degrees and elbow degrees and we add them up. Right, so we can actually think of range of motion as the sum total of all joints, right? You could even do one of these with the wrist, right? So you do wrist, elbow, shoulder, and then elbow or shoulder, and then elbow, then wrist. We add all of them up, and that's the total range of motion of the exercise, angular displacement at all joints. So very good technical definition. Um, so what does full ROM mean? Well, that's when things get a little bit more mysterious. It turns out full ROM is impossible to completely well define. Why? Uh, for some exercises, it's super easy to define. Full ROM on push-ups is super easy. You go down, you hit the ground. Okay, that's the end of that. And then you come up and you lock out. It's just physically impossible to go any further, right? But what about for dumbbell curls? What's full ROM for dumbbell curls? Like if you stop dumbbell curls here, okay, sweet. But what if you do some shoulder flexion? I mean, the biceps is involved in shoulder flexion. When you go back down, how far should you stretch on the way back? If you do an incline curl, you stretch further back than if you do a standing curl. So is a standing curl really partial range of motion? Gee, you know, that's a really good question. What we're definitely not addressing here is uh, the muscles full ROM. Because some people say, well, full ROM is bullshit because the muscles themselves are not being taken through the full range of motion. Of course not. Most muscles are designed in such a way that the physiological range of motion of the muscle, if you take it out of the body, stretch it to its limits and come back, uh, is way, way higher than anything can do in the body because it's attached to a joint that doesn't even maximally stretch the muscle. That's done for very good reason. Usually you maximize force production because if you stretch a muscle real far, it starts produ producing very little force and also to enhance safety. Like you don't want a part of your body that can be stretched so much it pops off. Uh, bad deal. I'll tell you what, high, muscles that experience high injury rates often are more designed like that. The hamstrings, for example, can be stretched well if you... Use enough weight in the stiff legged deadlift, uh, can be stretched beyond their physiological range, and then they get super fucking injured, and that's really, really bad. So, we're not talking about range of motion of the muscle. We're talking about exercise range of motion. So, um, when we talk about full ROM, we can usually talk about fuller and less full ROM, and we're not religiously and dogmatically saying, like, it's a full ROM or not. We're going to be talking about more range of motion, less range of motion, and uh, trying to figure out which one is better, what are the costs, what are the downsides, uh, which one is is, is uh, worse. And we want to basically get to a set of sort of dependable principles. It, when we come to a new exercise, we say, well, what should the range of motion be here? Uh, we want to come to a set of dependable principles that guides us to uh, very quickly selecting the range of motion that's probably a really good idea to do staying away from ranges of motion that, for a combination of reasons, might not be best. What are those reasons? We got four of them. Here's reason number one. One of the goals of range of motion is motor unit stimulation. Okay, we stimulate motor units. Those are groups of muscle fibers with one nerve attached to them. The nerve tells them to turn on, and they turn on as a group. They're located all throughout the muscle. And when they're active, they produce tension and they experience metabolite increases and that's how growth happens, right? So we have a whole bunch of motor units all through our muscles and the more of them we activate and the more of them we stress, the more we grow, right? Turns out, however, that not all motor units are active in all portions of the total muscle ROM. So like, for example, if you have biceps or your quads, you know, down here, from here to here, some motor units might be completely turned off. Uh, from here to here, some motor units might be completely turned off, and from here to here, some of them might be completely turned off. So if you only ever do curls like this, you're legit uh, risking just never turning on some motor units and thus having a fraction of your muscle never experience hypertrophy. Not the greatest thing in the world. Now, sometimes motor units turn on in partial ranges of motion, but not maximally, and only through very maximal high-rate coding activity, the nervous system really pushing them, do motor units experience most of the hypertrophy. So sometimes, if you curl from this range to this range, some motor units might turn on at various parts of that, but they contribute very little force, and they're never really turned on to a really, really high degree. Uh, that's not great, because we want them to turn on to as high a degree as possible to experience maximal hypertrophy, right? Uh, another thing is sometimes there's parts of a range of motion during which motor units turn on, and then parts during which they don't, they're not on at all. 
So in a curl, for example, hypothetically, there's, you know, from this range of motion to this range of motion, you know, during half of the first half, some motor units are really active. In the second half, they're really sort of not very active or not active at all, which means that when you are reaching concentric failure due to the limiting factor motor units that are on all of the time, the motor units are just on some of the time, they never get pushed very close to failure. And that's where most gains happen, or the vast majority of them anyway. And, and thus those motor units, you could say they're active, but they're not active through enough of the range of motion to become limiting factors to the motion, to get close to their maximum abilities to contract, to really experience high elevations of internal metabolite uh, flux like calcium and all this other stuff that probably causes muscle growth directly to occur. So basically, for lack of a better term, they're not pushed enough to their limits, and then they grow, don't grow much. So that's definitely a problem. However, a lot of these are pretty solvable problems because the more of a muscle's total range of motion you engage, the larger the volume of muscle you stimulate to grow. And if you curl from here to here, there's some stuff you're missing, right? It's probably like not a ton of stuff, but it adds up over time. However, if you curl as much as you can, the higher the range of motion you curl, or do any other exercise or any other muscle, the more of those uh, motor units you stimulate, the more of them you stimulate actively, and the more of them you stimulate for the longest time, turning them into motor units that experience a great deal of local fatigue and thus uh, very likely experience hypertrophy as well, right? So because of this, barring any other factors we can consider and we will consider, uh, extended range of motion training is just plain old better than limited range of motion training. Or just, just on that, on that face value for so goal number one, uh, more range of motion is better if, if for at least this reason. Okay. So that means that if you're given the choice to pick an exercise that's optimal or close, which is stupid because you got a bunch of choices anyway, and you can do variation. You know, what probably grows more muscle, regular bench press where the bar stops at your chest or a cambered bar bench where you can go deeper, probably the cambered bar bench. Cambered bar row is probably a little bit quote unquote better than the regular barbell row. And the deficit deadlift is hypothetically better for the people that are flexible enough to do it than a regular deadlift for hypertrophy purposes, right? In most cases, but we at least have a reason to believe that could be the case. All right. Goal number two. So it's not just the motor unit stimulation we're going for. It turns out safety is a really big concern. On the plus side of higher ranges of motion, in order to get the same intramuscular forces, you actually have to use less external weight. For example, if you use a squat and you squat halfway down and halfway or halfway down and up, right? You might have to throw like 400 pounds on your back and the force through the muscle is going to be some amount, very high. If you go to 300 pounds and you squat all the way down and all the way up, the leverages that your muscles are put under, squatting especially past parallel and back up, are really disadvantageous. Your muscle has to pull super mega hard in order to get your dumb ass out of the squat hole with 300 pounds. And it turns out that if you go close to failure and if you equate roughly the same reps, so whatever your set of eight was for 400 pounds, however much, you know, let's say 300 pounds is your set of eight to depth versus a set of eight halfway with 400, you actually end up having pretty similar peak forces uh, that you expose the muscles to because of the fact that the muscles are greatly disadvantaged. There's a lot of people, on the one hand, people say, like, I could do partial range of motion because I can lift more weight. But like, do you feel like it's just is more challenging to the muscles themselves? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, why don't you try going deeper? And they're like, no, no way. That's hard. And you're like, mm, isn't hard a good thing here? Like, oh, I guess it is. Right? So as far as the muscles are concerned, the force is basically very similar. Uh, if you do full range of motion with lighter weight or more range of motion with lighter weight, uh, and go through going through those very difficult sticking points, then if you more or less avoid the sticking points and do a partial range of motion that makes the lift sort of easier, so you have to use more weight. Now notice I'm saying that the forces presented are very similar. So what's the advantage of full range of motion? Well, here's the deal. What's the injury risk of going through a more full range of motion with 300 pounds in a squat versus a partial with 400? Well, I'll tell you this, anytime you handle big weights, your chance of injury goes up. But anytime you do full ranges of motion or fuller range of motion, as long as you're used to them and you've eased into them, that's not really a big chance of injury. It does not uh, an ob observation in, in sports uh, statistics for injury like, when people go through full range of motion, they're more likely to get hurt. That's just not a thing. When people use higher loads, they're always more likely to get hurt. You can take an extreme example uh, just to illustrate the point. 
If you have to squat with 400 pounds for all the way down squats, it sucks, right? You could get hurt. But if you're really strong, strong enough to do 400 for 10s, 400 pounds is never really enough force to like really mess with your tendons. Or if you're off a little bit one way or another, you have to like raise one foot, lift one foot. Um, gee, you know, 400 can definitely get you hurt, but it, it's a little bit controllable. Same person that does sets of 10 with 400, if they did half squats, would have to do like 585, like six plates on a side. 585, you zig when you're supposed to zag and you're done. You're loading through the spine way more weight, which increases the chance of spinal injury like crazy. Now, it's still a low total risk, but it might be double or triple the risk. So you're exposing your body to objectively heavier weights. You're increasing your risk. And the question is, for what purpose? Well, we said the transduction of force through the muscle is very similar what the hell are we doing? Like, are we just trying to get our joints strong? If that's the case, sure, partial lifting is not a terrible idea. But we're trying to go for muscular hypertrophy. It, the full range of motion gives us the same results from a force perspective for the muscles, which is generating tension and is a big factor of hypertrophy, with much less weight making it safer to get the same thing. In addition to that, per motor unit forces, which is a really big concern as well, because that's what really grows muscle, are the same same idea applies. High range of motion requires less external load. So high range of motion can get us the same hypertrophy on a load basis with much less risk for injury, which is a really, really good thing. On the other hand, if we take range of motion too far and we extend the range of motion considerably, what do we end up with? Well, if you do excessive, excessive ranges of motion, you can actually endanger muscle and connective tissue via stretch. For example, let's say you can do stiff leg of head lifts to 225 and you're so flexible that you can touch the barbell to the ground every time and it's that nice, painful, deep hamstring stretch that you love. Awesome. What if we put you on a six inch platform and told you to touch the ground with 225? And as a matter of fact, you said, oh, I can't. Well, let's put 275 on the bar. You can do that with touching the ground for sets of four. Try doing a set of four, but touch all the way down. 275 pounds, set of four all the way down. You're going to jack your shit up. Sorry for the lack of technical terminology here. Extreme stretch on a, on, on a muscle with a weight heavy enough to cause hypertrophy increases injury risk if that stress is so far beyond the muscle's normal capacity. And there's just no more to, way to stretch. Basically, muscles have passive and active stretching elements. Once you've stretched the active part of the muscle, and once you've stretched the passive as long as it goes, any more stretch is literally going to deform tissue and not in a way that is uh, uh, el elastic deformation. It doesn't just come back. It's what's called plastic deformation, which just goes, and then when you leave it alone, that's it, <laughs> right? And, and then your body can heal that, but that is formally an injury, right? And 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 that's how it, so you know, if you go way too range of motion, way too far range of motion, you can absolutely increase injury risk, right? In some exercises, this is basically impossible. Like in a barbell bench press, where are you going to go? Nowhere, right? But you can absolutely go deep enough on a, on a deficit push-up, stiff like a deadlift, and a, a couple of other exercises that you can absolutely increase your risk. So more ROM isn't necessarily safer. A high degree of range of motion is, but there is such a thing as excessive ROM for the connective tissue and the muscle itself. But there's another problem, very related. Even if the connective tissue is good, even if the muscle is good, right? So basically, we're talking about the muscle and the two tendons or the several tendons that attach it to whatever joints uh, or whatever bones they, co they connect to. That might be okay, but the joints moving themselves might have limitations, right? So if you move your shoulder to here, right, is it a good idea to move it here and then here and then all the way up here? Gee, with weight, maybe not. And joints had distinctly have safe ranges of motion and have relatively unsafe ranges of motion. Now, most joints, you're physically unable to move them any further than what is safe. For example, the elbow, you see they're locked out. And there's no elbow range of motion where it's too much, right? The bicep stops it or it's locked out, right? The shoulders, not the case. The spine, not the case, right? So if you want to do a leg press and you can't, you know, touch the bottom of the leg press, if you round your back like crazy, yes, your back is capable of rounding, but under those loads, none of the spinal joints are safe. And all of a sudden, you're going to herniate your discs and you're going to be like, oh man, like, I guess that was too much ramen. You'll be absolutely correct, right? So do we have any recommendations from here? Not yet. We need a little bit more information, okay? So, so far, we've got range of motion is usually good when it's better, or sorry, usually better when there's more of it, but there's definitely such a thing as too much. 
Point number three, goal number three of uh, a range of motion, stretch under tension. So it's been shown that stretch under tension is very likely an independent stimulator of hypertrophy, which is really cool. That means there is something about stretch under tension that grows muscle different than just providing tension or different than just stretching without tension. Okay? Sweet. We want to make sure we get that hypertrophy, maybe not all the time, but certainly in some exercises, some points during our training cycle, whether it be week, month, or year, we want to expose ourselves to stretch under tension. So um, a deep stretch, possibly even an uncomfortably deep stretch, so long as the joints are okay, so long as the connective tissues are okay and the muscle is okay, might be of benefit in exercises where it's possible. So for example, on a dumbbell bench press, like you want to stretch your pecs to where you're like, ooh, okay, I feel you pecs. Um, stiff legged like deadlifts for the hamstrings are like really good stretch is a good idea. Pull ups, full range of motion on the lats, stretch the, the lats at the bottom, very, very good thing because stretch and retention is a positive. So all of a sudden, we have a bit of an objective kind of goal to where we can say, okay, there's there for sure something called too much range of motion is unsafe. But until and unless we feel a stretch, usually we can keep going with range of motion. So now we have more of an objective rather than just more is better. Uh, we have something like, okay, if we're feeling a good deal of stretch under tension, there's probably not much more to get from that range of motion because after you feel stretch under tension, anything more range of motion than that is going to start to be incrementally more painful stretch. And that's probably going to run into joint problems or connective tissue or muscular problems. Now, Last goal of range of motion is an interesting one, consistency. It's not a direct goal, but it actually works really, really well. So imagine doing something like bicep curls and you just sort of like, you're not doing full range of motion. You're kind of curling like this. And some of the curls come up to here and go like all the way down, but sometimes the curls are just here. Like it can vary rep to rep, set to set, whatever. Like if you, if you're moving up a week to week over the, the course of a mesocycle and the weights get heavier, like you used to lock out all the way, but you're like, man, fuck that. Like I don't actually get these reps. Like I have a set of eight. I got to get eight. So like as you get tired, your reps get a little bit shallower, right? So what's the problem there, right? First problem, if you always do slightly different range of motion, how do you know you're getting stronger, right? The quintessential element of tracking for hypertrophy program is mesocycle over mesocycle over mesocycle, and especially block to block to block. Are you getting stronger? four reps in the rep ranges you train. If you're not, you're almost certainly not growing any muscle. If you are, whatever else is going on, you're probably growing muscle and you're doing super well. If you always alter your ROM, how do you know if you're getting stronger? It's funny because like every now and again, I'll lift at gyms, people ask me for a spot. And when I was a professor, I lifted university gyms in which the fuckery is super high. And when someone asked for a spot, and, uh, you know, they'll say like, oh yeah, like you're going to bench 250. And I'm like, how many do you want? And they're like, four. I'm like, sweet. And then like, they do like three bullshit half reps by themselves. And then they ask me to help on the last one. And then like, usually they'll do four and they'll ask for like one more. I'm like, okay, we're doing five together and I'm upright rowing 185 pounds for you, which I usually don't do. I just rack for them. After that kind of effort, what is that person's perception? Like is, is 250 pounds for five, whatever, quote unquote five. Is that a PR? Are they doing better? Well, who knows? What was the range of motion when the last time they did 250 or when they did 240? Uh, they have no idea because they weren't tracking it because they weren't standardizing it. It was a, it was a potentially almost certainly different range of motion. Very difficult to track progress if it was different, right? Um, another, and, and, and to that point, uh, probably a worse concern is how do you know if you're hitting maximum recovery volume or not? Maximum recovery volume is detected by a drop off, a consistent drop off in performance uh, within two, two consecutive sessions where you know you're underperforming hypothetically uh, during a time in your mental cycle when volume is really high. And you can usually pin that on. You've just exceeded your ability to recover because you're doing too much volume. The thing is, how do we know how we're performing? Well, we count reps and we count weight. We've got last week, I did 405 in the squat for a set of 10. This week, I did 410 for a set of six. Uh, and then I, later in the week, I did 410 for a set of five. Like clearly, I'm under recovers. This 405 for 10 does not match those other numbers by a long shot. The thing is, if you cut your reps, when you feel tired, when you're getting close to your MRV, you just cut your reps shorter. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're still quote unquote performing at the same level. So if you don't have a standardization based on one single kind of ROM, you have no idea if you're hitting your MRV, which can mean that literally you can train for weeks after you've hit your MRV, which is a really bad idea from injury perspective, from a muscle growth perspective. Really, really bad, bad uh, situation. Um, what about applying overload, right? You have a session on Monday. And a session next Monday of bench press. 
You did uh, four sets with 200 pounds for sets of 10, let's say, just to keep it simple. Uh, on last Monday, this next Monday, you want to provide an overload. And say like you got pretty sore last time, so you don't want to increase the number of sets and be too much. Uh, what do you do? Well, you know, so four sets with 200 pounds for sets of 10, you do four sets with 205 for sets of 10. Well, hold up. If you cut your reps a little bit with 205, uh, maybe you actually did more total work because the range of motion was higher for 200. Your overload for 200 and plus you missed out on some stretch under tension for this, uh, this one that you're cutting the reps. Yes, you're using more weight for the same reps and the same sets, but you're actually not providing an overload because you're doing physically less mechanical work and you're skipping the part that's most hypertrophic or very hypertrophic by itself. So all of a sudden, you're not providing overload. And as a matter of fact, if you alter your range of motion a ton, you cannot be sure that in any one session you're providing overload. You can be more sure if you add a bunch of sets, but listen, if you cut your reps by half, you can add, you go from four sets to eight sets. If you cut your reps by half, as far as rep range is concerned, you're still not providing an overload. It's probably just about the same thing, right? Or not providing an optimal overload. So how do you know if you're providing an optimal overload? How do you know if you're making things more difficult when you don't even know how difficult things are at any one time? Right. Uh, very, very big question and a question that's unable to, you're unable to answer if you're not consistent with your range of motion. Another one, the principle of direct adaptation, which we covered earlier in this lecture series means it implies that you need to retarget the same motor unit pool over and over and over for multiple sequential sessions to get the best possible results. Sweet. How do you know you're retargeting the same pool for direct adaptation if you're doing different ranges of motion? I can actually put this a better way. You're not. <laughs> Because if you change range of motion all the time, you're actually targeting slightly different motor unit pools and you're reducing your direct adaptation. Like, yeah, one day you do middle of the range bicep and, and then one day you do more full range. And so the middle of the range isn't pushed as hard as it was. And every other, you know, the, the new ranges are pushed, like they haven't been pushed in a while. So now they're, you know, they're experiencing a lot of novelty. And a lot of times people alter the range of motions week to week to week because they sense the novelty and they get sore, but that's not what we're after. We're for setting, settling our training in one particular way and then representing representing, representing, representing a similar stimulus with more and more of it, that's the best way to gain. So if you don't standardize your technique as far as range of motion, you can't do that either. Uh, and it's not that just you can't track it, you're probably not doing it, right? Good news, standardizing range of motion solves all these problems, right? And here's the thing, you can standardize any range of motion. It doesn't have to be full. You can do a pin press on the bench from here to here. <laughs> As you have pins here and pins here, like you put pins at the bottom, pins at the top, and you're going ding, 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 and that's technically standardized. It's going to be the same every single week. But that takes a lot of work, right? You got to put two sets of pins into a power rack. That means you got to take pins out of the other rack. And the guy's like, hey, I'm using that. You're like, shut up. I got to do my stupid pin press, right? Also, I got to make an inordinate amount of noise hitting metal on metal. Like, that's cool. If you want to train like that, good thing is full range of motion makes a very easy standardization. It's auto standardized most of the time. Not all the time because remember bicep curls, who knows? But usually like, you know, push-ups. How do you know if you're improving on push-ups? Well, every time your chest hits the ground, every time you lock out, gee, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room in that. Bench press is even easier because there's no hip bullshit going on. So you touch your chest, you fully lock out. You touch your chest, you fully lock out. Someone's like, hey, Harry, let's just take the first question here. Um, how do you know if you're getting stronger? You're like, I bench 225 for a set of 10 two months ago. Today, I got 250 for a set of 10. They're like, did you shut your chest both times? You're like, yep, every single rep. Like, did you lock out? Yep, every single breath. They're like, gee, well, you got stronger. That's it. Problem solved, right? And all of these questions get a check mark next to them if you do the same range of motion. Full range of motion for another example is squatting all the way to depth as long as your back doesn't round, making it unsafe for your joints. Every time you squat to depth and every time you come up, it's the same squat, basically. So you can standardize that and know what you're getting every single time, right? And squatting is a real good example. People get into all kinds of fuckery. They're like, I PR'd on my squat. And you watch them squat. And some reps are below parallel. Some reps are above. And you're like, ah, exactly how you know you're PRing, right? You maybe not say that to them to their face, but you sure as hell think it. All right. Technical subject here, but very related to the range of motion question. Exercise variation is the first one, and force curve matching is the second. Uh, even with a full range of motion, every exercise doesn't stimulate every part of a muscle. Here are some examples. Incline curls, right? If you're leaning back on an incline and curling and you stop here, they don't stimulate the shoulder flexion and action of a bicep and thus probably don't recruit full motor units in the bicep because some of them are very, very good at the shoulder flexion part and not very good at anything else. Squats, let me say for my quadriceps, you might say quads are for your tricriceps. I don't know where I was going with that one. Uh, there are four quadricep uh, subunits of your muscle, but it turns out that the rectus femoris attaches across the hip and is only remotely maximally activated 
if you are extending the knee without simultaneous uh, hip extension uh, and or you are extending the knee uh, with simultaneous hip flexion. Like uh, that really works well to target the rectus femoris. In the squat, you extend the knee as you simultaneously extend the hip. So the rectus femoris actually just sort of, it changes its length on the back end and the front end. So it kind of just sits around doing more or less a whole lot of nothing. So squats don't activate your rectus femoris a lot, which actually means that if you want that middle part of your quad, the one that bulges out in the middle of your quads, right? There's the bulge on the outside, inside in the middle. The middle is squats are not a great exercise for that. Leg extensions are a pretty decent exercise for that. Another really good exercise for that is hanging like some weights on your legs hanging on a bar and kicking your legs out while you curl and do an ab curl like that. Really blast the rectus femoris, but you know, squats don't do that. So when people say squats train your entire quads, like that's actually not true, right? Um, another really, really good example is the back. People say completely insane things like, what's the best exercise for the back? Like, okay, let's unpack that. You're asking what the best exercise is for the spinal erectors the lats, the teres major, the rhomboids, the middle traps, and possibly the upper traps. Are you, are you five nine? You think there's one exercise? That you could might as well ask like, hey, what's the best exercise for your upper body? Like the whole thing at the same time? There is no exercise like that, right? So if you just, a lot of people, it makes mindless articles on the internet, um, uh, you know, rows versus pull-ups for back development. Get that out of my face. Why are we, it's like saying like pasta versus chicken for, you know, constructing a meal. You probably need both, man. That's a ridiculous comparison. Now, if you say for lat hypertrophy, that's a one muscle, you got a good article on your hands. Meadow Henselman's has a good article in which he shows that rows probably aren't nearly as good for the lats as pull-ups or overhead pulling. Uh, that's probably correct, right? But for the back, that's pure nonsense, right? So, if you're looking for one exercise, just a full enough range of motion to hit your whole back, you're probably looking for something that really doesn't exist, right? So how do we solve this problem? Well, the good news is we're not constrained to one exercise. Where there's no like god of hypertrophy, I'm short of Ronnie Coleman maybe, that's watching over you and saying, nope, just one exercise, you can't do any more. Two to four exercises per mesocycle or per block of training is really good for the same muscle but the two to four exercises can't be, shouldn't be redundant. They should be of differing angles, differing positions of feet and hands to target as much of the total muscular muscle group as possible. For example, a, a possible way to construct um, a, a back uh, hypertrophy uh, a plan, a mesocycle is have some kind of vertical pull, pull ups, have some kind of row where you do, you know, barbell rows, for example, for a bunch of the rhomboids and all that other stuff. Uh, potentially some kind of exercise where you do a lot of uh, spinal extension, like, um, uh, like a machine row where you really arch up on the pad for your spinal erectors. And then maybe even an exercise, which it does your lats just by themselves, some kind of pullover. If you have four of those in, in a back, a week of training or month of training or, um, a block of training with several months strung together, then, you know, you're really covering all of your bases for your entire back and you're really, really good to go. But if your idea of back training is like, I've literally talked to people like, what do you do for back? Like pull ups. I'm like, that's it. Just pull ups, huh? And they're like, yep. I'm like, sweet. You're the man. <laughs> like, that's all you're going to need for your lats. Totally. Right. Most of your lats for everything else. It's just not going to cut it. Right. So no reason to do just one exercise. So that really solves a big problem for us. Next problem, force curve matching. So, uh, an exercise can uh, match the force curve of a muscle very, very poorly. Um, you know, for example, some bicep exercises, they're really hard at the bottom, but as soon as you clear the bottom, they're super easy all the way through. And the muscle is really active just at that range of motion, and a lot of motor units are active, but and, and, and it, when you fail, you always fail at that range of motion, but there's not really any uh, much stimulus for all the motor units that are engaged from here on out. Yeah, they're being activated, but very submaximally. And remember, submaximal activation, especially if the set isn't close to failure, which it won't be close to failure to these motor units, it's just not very good for results. It's not very good for muscle growth. So ideally, we want to choose exercises and machines that match force curves closely. Some, very few free weights do this, but some machines, so for example, squatting, really tough at the bottom, not tough at all at the top. 
Some machines do this pretty well. A good leg extension machine will be tough at every single part of the range of motion. A good lat pull down machine or vertical pulling machine will be tough at every part of the range of motion. A great rowing machine, very hard at the bottom to give a big, good, powerful stretch, gets easier on the way up, which is why a um, chest supported machine row that's on an angle is usually a good exercise. It gets easier at the top so you can get that top squeeze and engage all those smaller muscles of your back that just would never be pushed to their limits because you're all you can do is touch basically. And as soon as you fail with those muscles, your lats are barely even turned on because they're like, well, gee, this part's so easy because we have to use enough weight to be able to come all the way up, right? So machines can solve this problem, uh, but you can't use machines for everything. And every time they compare machines to barbells or free weights, barbells or free weights do at least as well and sometimes better. So it's not the end all be all. Yes, you want to avoid machines and movements that are really, really crappy to match force curves for sure. So like if you have two lat pull down machines, or two back machines, we'll say, and one of them just, like, it's tough at one part of the range of motion, but it's the easiest thing in the world at another, and it's not the part of the range of motion that you want to be easy, then uh, sometimes it, you know, if you have another machine that just fits just right, using the just right machine is way better. Here's an example. Some assisted pull-up machines provide almost no resistance at the stretch, which is stupid because stretch under tension is powerful. And then as you come up, it gets harder and harder, which is by the way, when you get mechanically weaker and you're barely able to get up here and then it comes back down and there's no stretch. What a stupid machine. And people design these things. A much better assistive pull-up machine is one that really is tough at the bottom, but as you go up, it gets a little bit easier and you can get that ball or squeeze all the way. And then it again, super deeply stretches you, matches the force curve of a bunch of muscles and hits all of our checklists for full range of motion, full motor unit recruitment and stretch under tension. Definitely choose those machines. However, a lot of this stuff can be solved by choosing many different exercises. Remember, you're already choosing two to four exercises. So if you say like someone says, well, even in vertical pulling, the lats technically don't reach the end of their physiological range of motion, not even close. That's totally true because, you know, right here, your lats aren't very stretched. They were, are stretched over here. How can you solve that? Well, you do some pullovers where your lats are super stretched, right? Uh, you know, some kinds of vertical pulling barely involve the, uh, you know, all sorts of other muscles in the back, the, the traps, the spinal rectus, so on and so forth. So you do some rolling in addition to that. And rows, gee, rows don't match the lat force curve almost at all, but other exercises do, right? So if you do two to four different kinds of exercises and each time you pick the exercises, you just don't want to pick the ones that are just stupidly off the force curve of the muscle or the exercise then you end up getting a really good uh, total a total workout, you end up getting a total session, and the hypertrophy is super awesome. So we don't have to get too crazy about, okay, we got to modify all the exercises to be perfect. If you do multiple exercises and they're all decent, they come together to form a really, really good program. So let's take this in and get some programming considerations. In most cases, you want to do the highest range of motion, the biggest range of motion that does two things. One, doesn't exceed safe muscle or joint flexibility. So if you see someone doing leg presses and they're super deep, but they're really rounding their back a lot, not good, too much range of motion. And two, doesn't radically reduce external loading and then, uh, because that can reduce total muscle force generation. And sometimes it does that via a reduction in stability, right? So there's some exercises that the range of motion is so, so for example, if you do dumbbell flies deep enough, you start wobbling at the bottom end and you can only use like the tens. Well, if you do them a little bit less deep, you could use the forties. It's basically an exercise in stretching. You have to reduce the load so much that even the load through the muscle isn't that great anymore. It's just a matter of getting as big of a stretch as possible. If you want to do stretch, do yoga or Pilates. Don't bother with hypertrophy training. A full range of motion is good. Some stretch under tension is good, but you don't want to go so crazy that you're not, you're reducing the weight so much to be able to get in that range of motion. The total force and the intramuscular force falls down a ton. The way you can feel that is you can actually perceive it. It's not rocket science. You do super crazy way too extended dumbbells and someone's like, can you, you feel that in your chest? You do like a set of 10 close to failing and you're like, to be honest, I really feel it in my tendons and in my joints, but like, I don't even have a chest pump. Like, yeah, it's too much range of motion, right? But if you do nice deep range of motion, you're going to feel it a ton on your chest. And after you're done with a set, someone's going to be like, do you feel that in your chest? You're like, oh my God, my pecs are going to blow up. Whereas if you use much more weight, you use a partial range of motion, someone's like, hey, do you feel that in your chest? You're like, yeah, it's pretty good. And then someone's like, hey, go back to much deeper. You do deeper and you're like, wow, that's way, way killer. So you can tell these things. It's not super, super crazy. You can intuit a lot of them. You want to choose exercises that match the force curves of the muscles as well as possible 
but you don't want to compromise stretch under tension too much trying to do that. For example, um, banded leg presses. Uh, are they better than regular leg presses? Yes, probably, because then the leg press doesn't get easier a ton as you go up. However, one of the advantages of leg press is the massive stretch under tension it causes your quads at the bottom if you do it right. You you guys know what I'm talking about that I've done deep leg presses before. You physically feel your quads deforming at the bottom, especially when you have a big pump already. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. That causes a ton of hypertrophic stimulus. By banding your leg presses and putting a lot of band tension on them, you reduce the external load so much that at the very bottom, there isn't that stretch under tension thing nearly as much anymore. You're missing a big fraction of the exercise. Yes, putting bands on things, if it matches the force curve better, is good. And if it's not costing you too much time or energy or really like throwing off, like so for example, people do like dumbbell, uh, banded dumbbell presses, that's ridiculous because it's so unstable. It's like a total crapshoot, total force production is way down. It's absolutely not worth it. But if you're doing Smith machine squats, uh, if you're doing um, uh, hack squats, for example, leg presses, some kind of machines for the back, if you throw on some light bands, it can make the force curve better, but still get that raw, nasty stretch under tension that you're really, really looking for. And of course, lastly, you want to choose two to four exercises per muscle group, per mesor block, and they have to be different angles. And a lot of times you want to attend to the major different ways in which muscles and muscle groups are stimulated. For example, your pecs for full development probably need like at least three things. They probably need some flat pressing work because a lot of times that gets the sternal pack, which decline is just redundant for. And, you know, flat or decline work. Decline work is just tough to set up, so it's stupid. Um, incline work because that trains the clavicular pecs, different part of the muscle, won't be maximally active with flat. And some flies, preferably flies that you can do regular dumbbell flies are totally cool. But every now and again, you want to throw in some flies where the machine loaded and you get peak contraction. So when you come all the way in or even across like this, you get a lot of contraction at the very tip, which you don't get very much with bench presses of any kind, right? Or any presses of any kind. And you don't get even with uh, free dumbbell flies because by the time you get here, gravity doesn't pull the flies apart anymore, right? So that's a really, really good idea uh, to make sure you checklist. So basically every major function and limiting factor of the muscle, it's not that hard to do, but if you get it done, you're going to be in line for maximum hypertrophy. Summary and implications. Last slide here. Full range of motion can sometimes sound like meaningless dogma. And if people don't know why they're saying it, it absolutely is meaningless dogma, at least as far as they're concerned. So it's got limits, right? You don't do eight inch deficit deadlifts while rounding your back like crazy and screaming full ROM, bro. Like, yeah, you'll be screaming a lot worse things when your discs pop out of your ass and hit somebody in the face, right? That being said, larger ranges of motion usually have advantages so long as they're still producing lots of force, like not the 10 pound dumbbell example for flies, and as long as they're safe. If that's the case, if something is producing lots of force, and if it's safe and you can feel the muscle being tensed, which is exactly what force production is, it's probably a good thing to do as much ROM as you can, given those two things are checked off the list. So a good default on most exercises is what I would call externally viewed full range of motion. So like full squats, uh, touching the bar to your tummy on rows. Like if you're stopping the bar like three inches away from your stomach on rows, like we're going to ask why. And there's probably no good answer to that. Chin over the bar on pull-ups. You know, maybe you can, if you touched your uh, chest on pull-ups, that'd be great. Not everyone's strong enough to do that. So it's, you know, as long as you get your chin up or close, that's good. So on and so forth. That's the default. That's where it starts. Then you have to use your intellect, take yourself through all four of these goals, check mark them and see where you are, you know, safe, where you could be extending the ROM, how you feel the exercise best. There's always room for nuance, right? If I see someone in the gym that's squatting well below parallel, but not all the way down, I don't automatically think they're a stupid person and they're moral for cutting their depth. I'm interested in why. And they might say, well, you know, actually my knee hurts if I go lower than this, or, you know, I actually feel my quads less at the bottom because my glutes activate more. Uh, that's totally fine. It's totally cool. No big deal there. It's all about individual adjusting to their considerations and uh, uh, sort of adjusting the default ROM to get the best possible hypertrophic stimulus based on all of these checklists, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Next time, we are going to talk about, gee, deep dive into specific mechanistic causes of hypertrophy, tension mechanisms, metabolite mechanisms, really cool lecture. 